Well, good evening and greetings in Jesus' name. I am uh, really uh, eager to share this message tonight. It's not always every message that I'm just eager to share. Um, sometimes it's work, sometimes it's uh, something you've got to carry. But uh, this, this message tonight is one that's uh, very um, dear to me, and I'm so happy uh, when we serve the Lord, that we don't have to um, choose a lot of either or. Like, we don't have to choose, well, do I have a uh, godly family or do I go to a godly church? You can actually do both. Do I walk with Jesus or do I study the Bible? You can do both. And so, in this subject that I want to share tonight, it's, it's another one of those that goes very well along with the rest of everything that's in the scriptures. Um, and uh, this particular subject is um, very practical, incredibly practical. Practical, it impacts our lives very much. And um, what this subject, the price that it's cost me to preach this subject, as well as um, the years put into it, uh, you know, Often we treasure things in proportion to the value, you know, what we invest in them. And so this is a, a precious subject to me. If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn uh, with me to the opening text. It's in Matthew 8, verse 17. Matthew 8, 17. In just uh, a little while, we'll look at the context. But for right now, we're just going to look at the, the exact text. Something happened. It was actually Peter's... Um, uh, wife's mother got healed, and then out of that, they brought everybody to the door. We'll talk about that later. But And he healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, saying, he took our infirmities and bore our diseases. Okay, let me read that again. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoke, spoken through Isaiah the prophet, saying, he took our infirmities and bore our diseases. In just a little bit, we'll look at where Isaiah the prophet said that, and, and we'll turn back to the original, but uh, right now we just want to think about the, the, the title of our text, He Took Our Infirmities and Bore Our Diseases. It's actually one of the names of God, Yahweh Rapha, or the Anglic Anglicized word, Jehovah. Jehovah Rapha is God my healer. God the healer. It's actually one of his names. It's uh, quoted it first, in, I believe, in Exodus 15, 26. I won't, for the sake of time, turn there. But God my healer. I am the Lord that heals you. It's actually part of the person, the very character and nature of who God is. And uh, so I have a lot of things to say tonight. I'll talk fast. And you listen fast and maybe we can get along just well. The problem is... Other nights when I had seven or eight pages of notes, I didn't get them all covered, and now I have more than that, and so I'm not sure how it's going to go, but we're going to give a run for it, because there's things that I don't want to miss that are important to this subject, and so I hope the Lord can um, help me to deliver in such a way that I get the key points that are important. Back to what I said earlier about not being either or, it's all part of God's wonderful package of grace and provision. I'm also glad to inform you tonight, this is not some wonderful revelation or idea that I just got this afternoon. Uh, Brother Burton shared about that a little bit in his prayer for me, about things that have been formed in the fire, things that have come through, you know, when you want to um, purify gold or silver, you put it in a cauldron or a, a, a sulfur vessel that's, that takes very high heat, and then you turn the uh, uh, temperature way up, and you, you get that thing going, and you get rid of the, the, the dross. And God, God has to do that in our life, because something wonderful like this might have uh, elements sometimes that, that our flesh gets in the way. And so I will talk about that. Um, However, I will talk just a little bit practically about my walk, because some of you don't know me. I have had the privilege of seeing scores of healings and miracles. I've seen surgeries canceled. I've seen people come off their deathbed. This is not just something, an idea I got yesterday. Um, this is real, and it walks. Uh, you heard me talk on, uh, when I talked about spiritual authority, how um, 
when I read Mark 16, I said, well, this is the Word of God. We should believe it. And then for some reason, the way God works individually with each one of us, I kind of locked in on that one. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And so for eight years, that was my thing. I just kept praying and seeking the Lord. And, and during that time, I didn't see any of these things I just talked about. Um, but I want to say humbly that while what I just said is uh, totally true, uh, I've also seen people die from cancer. I've seen sicknesses not get healed or just run their natural course. I've ridden lights and sirens in the back of an ambulance when the medic said, I don't know what we got going on, but put it, they, they, they have a term, they say 95 it. That means put it down and get into the hospital as fast as you can as I watched over the lifeless form of my four-year-old. And I called my brothers and I called my friends and I said, please pray. I didn't know what's going on, but pray for our little, our little child. We're not getting through. My wife held him in her arms as, she, as he shut down. But by the grace of God, two hours later, I walked out of that hospital with that four-year-old miraculously healed, totally healed, had to sign a lot of papers. Um, and... Uh, I just remember how blue the sky was and how green the grass was. But my point is, these things are really real. Why didn't God answer before the, the ambulance ride? And some of those things we can learn, and some of those things we just don't always know and understand. We don't understand everything that goes on behind the scenes. Maybe most importantly is none of the above things that I shared as I relate to the subject of healing, possibly next to my relationship with Jesus, the most important fact in my heart is that I've earned the trust of the young lady that was my co-parent of these children, my wife. Because you see, she wasn't raised with anything like this, and I was a little bit of a zealot, and I loved Jesus, and I was radical, but she had a fear that uh, depending on what would happen, I would make some decisions, and one of our young children would die as a result of my lack of wisdom and discernment. That's a pretty significant fear to overcome, don't you think? And I must hasten to say that her fears were not all unfounded. See, I was so excited about what God was showing me and about these things, but God wants to grow us up, that we be no more, Ephesians 4 says, no more uh, children tossed to and fro, cast about by everything, but we're solid and we're anchored. And this has been part of my journey. And um, I remember the day when, well, let me talk about that, that day when I went in that, um, in that ambulance. The medic met the ambulance at the end of our street. I was away. I came home. I came there at the same time the medic came. And my dear wife jumped out, and I jumped in. And it wasn't because of how much she trusted me that she did that. It was how much she trusted Jesus. And she went back and started praying. She just hoped that I would do the right thing and that she could trust Jesus with me. <laughs> and I didn't know until later when I called her home. And I, it looked like God had healed our son. And I called home. And I asked what she, her thoughts were and what I should do. She said, this is what she said on the other end of the phone line. Well, whatever you think, God, how God is leading you. And she told me when she hung up the phone later that that was the last thing she wanted to say. <laughs> she wanted to say a lot of other things. And she got on her knees and said, Jesus, please take care of that boy. Please, I don't know which boy, both of them actually, I do. <laughs> And that, to me, is worth more than a claim to power, and that is trust. We need both. We need both, but we must be able to walk in a trustworthy way. And the day came many years later when finally my dear wife says to me, okay, now you can preach about the subject. She wasn't a control freak, not at all. But there had to be trust earned. And there was a day when she saw how it walked. And she said, okay, the walk and talk now are matching in a way that it makes sense to preach. 
I'm not awry, brothers and sisters, not at all. I told you, there's things I don't understand. We're going to talk about some of those things. What do you do when, you're, when your walk and your belief don't line up? That can be so excruciating. So we're going to talk about that tonight, but that's not what we want to talk about right now. There's much I've learned and much I'm still learning. I invite you along with me tonight as we explore this most important subject that Jesus and I love, the enemy hates, and man hangs in the balance. Should I say that again? This most important subject that Jesus and I love, and I trust some of you, the enemy hates, and man hangs in the balance. Once again, like other nights, I acknowledge this subject is controversial to some. And once again, I don't think it's because the Bible isn't clear. I feel the Bible is very clear. The controversy, most of all of that I've heard, is not about the Bible isn't clear. It's about what happens when earth doesn't line up with what the Bible says. And then people will make very interesting stories up. So tonight, instead of looking at experience, it is good to have some experience. It's good to share some of those stories. Let's look into God's Word. It is wonderful If God's word and our experience line up, but let the word be our guide. If we allow experience to be our guide, we run the risk of the dog, I'm sorry, the tail wagging the dog, and that doesn't come out the best. It must be in the right order, and then the word of God can shape our experience. So we're going to go back now again to Matthew um, 8, where our text is. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, saying, He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. I'm now going to turn back, if you'll turn with me, to where that's quoted, which is Isaiah 53. And we are going to read Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 5. Speaking of Jesus, it was a prophetic um, uh, verses about Jesus, uh, most Bible scholars and Christians agree with that. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of suffering and acquainted with disease. He was despised as one from whom men hid their face, and we didn't respect him. Surely he has borne our sickness and carried our suffering, yet we considered him plague, struck by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought our peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Now, some of you have other translations, uh, most notably maybe the King James, that says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So, do we have a problem here tonight? Is this, uh, here you got the proof, there's an inaccuracy in the Word of God. Is that what is going on here? No, that is not the problem. The fact is, the Hebrew words, and you'll find this Many times, if you're involved in Bible translation, um, the, the, the one ma- language doesn't exactly match another language. And these root words can justly and rightly be interpreted either way. They can be interpreted griefs and sorrows, or sicknesses and infirmities. And I'm kind of excited because God has not done this many places. There's a few key places that the Lord has done this where He took such a possible translation issue, and quoted it exactly in the New Testament to make sure we got the right one, the correct translation. It's not many places he's done that. But in Matthew 8, verse 17, in our our English Bibles, it's very clear, our sicknesses and our infirmities. Now, does that say he didn't take our griefs and our sorrows? Oh, no. I mean, that's so clear from all the rest of Scripture, right? Right? He's, he's, he's the one who's there to be our comforter, to, to minister to us no matter what's going on in life. But he wanted to make sure we got this one, that he carried our sicknesses and our infirmities. Let me read it again. Uh, uh, Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our sickness and carried our suffering. And now I'll go back to Matthew 8, 17. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. All right, at this point, I am now uh, going to read Matthew 8, verses 1 to 18 to give us the whole context. And then we are going to make some applications. So again, if you have your Bibles with you, start with me at Matthew 8, verse 1. 
When he, Jesus, came down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Behold, a leper came to him and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you want to, you can make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I want to be made clean. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell, that you tell nobody, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the gifts that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. When he came into Capernaum, a centurion came to him, saying, Ask him for help, saying, Lord, my servant lies in the house paralyzed, grievously tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Are you seeing a little theme? I want to. If you want to, you could. I want to. My servant lies grievously tormented. I will come. Isn't that wonderful? The centurion answered, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority, having under myself soldiers. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And I tell another, come, and he comes. And I tell my servant, do this, and he does it. We talked about spiritual authority the other night. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, did he say something about authority? No, what did he talk about? Faith. What Jesus was saying is this centurion understands who I actually am. He can see right through it. He knows I'm the son of God. And because he knows how authority works, he knows that I absolutely do not need to come. Because when I give the order, the supernatural order, boom, it's going to be done. Because he understood that if he gives orders, I want you to get me a coat, done. I want you to shine my boots, done. I need my sword, done. I need the, the garden with it, done. Because he was set up that way in authority, and he knew it was all Jesus needed to do spiritually in the spirit world was say, and it was done. And was he right? Yes, he was right. And Jesus marveled that he understood that because quite evidently there was some of Jesus' people that didn't quite get the message. They didn't get the memo. Well, what authority do you have? Listen, this applies to today, and it's not so much about healing night, but it applies very much the same thing happens today. There are Gentile, unbelieving, or, or, or unreligious people that understand who Jesus is, and there's religious people saying, well, we need to check that. We need to ask a few more questions. They both saw the same evidence. Arguably, the religious leaders saw more evidence. And they came out to very different deductions, and it still happens today. Well, we'll continue on. This is what Jesus said after that. Most certainly, I tell you, I haven't found so great a faith, not even in Israel. I tell you that east and from the west, and will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom will be thrown out into the outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to the centurion, go your way, let it be done for you as you have believed. The servant heals that, uh, in that same hour. And then Jesus comes on his journey. And he comes to Peter's house or wherever they were going. And there's somebody sick. And he walked right by and ignored them. Oh, no. Somebody said that's not what he did. You're right. He touched her hand and the fever left her. Now, maybe she asked. Maybe she didn't. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But I want to. If you would just speak the word, I will. I'll come. Here's somebody sick. And the fever leaves her. Another place says he rebuked the fever. And these common people who weren't so stuck up got the memo. Just like the centurion. They're like, hey, da-dung, da-dung, da-dung. Yo, I'm going to go get some sick people. Right? Is that what happened? Yes. And they were all disappointed that time because Jesus was done working for the day. It was in the evening. And he timed out, and they all had to wait for another day, right? Nope. No. What did Jesus do? I think there's a typographical error here. Okay, I'm trying to make a point. I hope you get it. It says he healed them all. Is that an error? No. That is not an error. He didn't heal some. He didn't say, well, let's do a few token healings and tell the rest to come back tomorrow. I'll heal three of them so you know I'm still in the healing business and the altar clothes closed for tonight. I got to get some rest. Tomorrow you come back here. No, he healed them all. They brought them all 
Let's read it. When the evening came, they brought to him many possessed with demons. He cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. And I believe I'll stop reading there. Now, you might say, well, Merle, that's really true. That's wonderful. But what about the pool of Siloam? He didn't heal everybody there. And I say, you're correct. However, there is one notable difference. They were not all coming to him. And he still did not pass by without healing at least one. Am I correct? And there were some places where maybe he hardly, you want to say he didn't heal anybody, but that's not what the scriptures say. He said only a few. We don't have any place where it says he could do nothing there. There's places where he could only do a little bit. There was only a little faith, a little request, a little hunger coming. And so therefore he did those things. I would submit to you tonight for your consideration. There's not one recorded instance in New Testament in Jesus' ministry where someone asked to be healed and was denied. There's not one. There may have been people that passed by, but everybody who pressed through, he healed. Now, I hope you don't think that I'm out of order in suggesting to you that Jesus actually came to show us the way to the Father. Is that, most of you are okay with that? Jesus came to be an example of God's way. So, as religious students, as Bible students, we should probably look how he walked, right? Okay, let's do that then. Matthew 4, 17 to 25, we'll start in Matthew 4. And this is right when his public ministry started. Matthew 4, verse 17. So we can talk, start a few minutes, a few verses before if we wanted to, but we'll start where it says, From that time Jesus began to pe- preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he walked, was walking by the sea. And uh, he saw two brothers casting their net. He said, come after me. I'll make you fishers of men. men. They immediately left and follow, uh, followed him. And going on, he saw some more, said, follow me, and so on and so forth. In verse 23, Jesus went about in all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness among the people. And then the report went out uh, Throughout the whole, whole region there, through, into Syria, they brought to him all who were sick, afflicted with various diseases and torments, and possessed with demons, epileptics, and paralytics. And he told, them, told some of them, well, it's not God's will for you to be healed right now. No, he healed them. Great multitudes followed him. So, you will at least give me the grace and uh, patience and freedom tonight to say, yes, okay, Jesus did walk that way. We're, we're, we're still tracking, right? Now it gets a little interesting. Let's move on over to Luke 9. We, we all love Jesus, don't we? We like baby Jesus in the manger. We like Jesus that fed the five thousands and makes our belly full. We like Jesus the healer. Wonderful, wonderful. Everybody likes Jesus until he starts putting his feet forward and laying his demands on us and his requests and his cross because it's delayed gratification we heard tonight it's not because he's against us he just doesn't want us to keep playing on the road and getting hit like steve talked about his son and here's what he said he called the 12 together and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases and he sent them out to preach god's kingdom and to heal the sick do you agree to with me are we still together so far that this is what he told the 12 to do Okay, now we just stepped across a little line from Jesus to 12 men. But we all know they were really special. They were ones he chose. They were the disciples. There was only ever 12 of them. The reason we know they're very special is they walk with Jesus. And they even have in Revelations, is it the gates or the foundations with their name on? So, you know, we know that's a very special charge. And there's definitely not, doesn't apply to us yet. All right, now we will continue on our little journey through the scripture discovery process to Mark 16. And we are going to start reading at verse 14. Afterward, he was revealed to the eleven as they, as, 
themselves as they sat at the table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they didn't believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to the whole creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who disbelieves will be condemned. These signs will accompany those that believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new languages. They will take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will in no way hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. You say, there you got it, Merle. That's right. It's the 12 again, or 11, or whoever. It, except one little problem. Matthew 28 says that they are supposed to teach us all things that he has commanded them. You saw me coming, didn't you? So are you going to submit to that tonight, or are you going to keep it over there with the disciples? Well, you can just think about that and pray, but I think the Bible's pretty clear. I think we're supposed to preach the gospel, heal the sick, De uh, set uh, demonic pe people in de demonic bondage free. That's what my Bible says. And as I look at Acts, and as I look at what they did, that's what they did. That's just pretty clear. A fourth grader could get that one. You would have to go to seminary to figure out how not to obey that. I mean, I'm not against, there's a place maybe for seminary if it's the right study, but you see what I'm saying? It's very basic. The problem is when we say yes, Jesus, and then we don't not know what to do with all of what we see that doesn't line up. Does that create a problem for us? Yeah. Yes, it creates a problem for us. And people struggle to find their way. So before we go any further on this journey of himself taking our infirmities and bearing our diseases and then asking us to be his representatives in the world and take that power and that authority out to those we meet, before we press that home any further, I want to talk about a few stories, my own personal story and how I found my way. And maybe it will be helpful to somebody here. So some of you that were here the other night, I shared that when I was 15 year, years old, I read these verses in Mark 16, I believed. And then it was eight years later when I was 23, when I got to experience my first miracle and how excited I, I was about that. But what I didn't share with you was my own personal journey. What you don't know is I was very excited to see that happen to my daughter. But there was something of far, far more importance to me and that is, I was a sick person, a sick young person. When I was about 12 years old, my father, and I, was, I think it was August, July and August, made me stay inside during the uh, summer and rest and lay down on the sofa just to try to get my strength back and get my immune system back. I grew up with one of those little puffers. You know, nebulizer, you get that, uh, what do they call it, antihistamine, I think it's called, whatever the drug you put in so you can breathe and brothers and sisters if you don't know what it's like to not to be able to breathe it's not a very nice feeling and for whatever reasons every bug that came along my immune system was not strong I'd pick it up and it would always go straight to my respiratory tract there was genetic reasons for that it had been passed down generations and so time went on and when I was eight in 18 should have been the prime of my life right that's, you know, that's when young men join the military and do the push-ups and run the races and all this stuff. When I was 18, twice in one winter, I had pneumonia. That's a recipe to die young, brothers and sisters. I had a poor immune system. I just seen I picked everything up that came along, and it always went straight to my respiratory tract, to my lungs. Anybody here that would really like to die young from pneumonia or something like that? See, I didn't know anything about COVID-19 yet. If I would have knew about COVID-19, I would have had 15, 20 years to worry that I didn't. I'm going to tell you when it came, even though God had totally changed my life, I remembered. I thought to myself, I know what I believe. And I'm going through but my lungs may be scarred. I may be in for a ride. I, the only thing I really remember about COVID-19, personally, is I slept for 24 hours straight, 
and I was sick for about three days. It was, very, it was something very different from normal thing, and, and out the other side, and away we went. And I was excited again, very much so. Today, because of how Jesus has guided my walk, many times things will come through. My family, we have a, big, a large family, so children pick things up. They'll come through, and time and time again, I can't tell you how many times, Half of them get sick, different ones get sick, but I don't get sick. Is that because I'm better? No. It's a testimony to Jesus' grace and healing in me. You see why it's important to me? I want to see the glory of God. I care about Jesus' glory. But it also literally saved my life. And I want to tell you something that happened during the COVID pandemic. I was called to another state, to a church I was working with. Group of brothers, dear brothers, brothers I knew. There's a young man there. I don't remember his exact age, but about 35, 36. And I heard he got COVID. He went down, 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 and then he died. And they said, Merle, will you come here and preach the funeral message for this elder? He'd just been married not long before. Very heartbroken wife. I said, sure, I'll come. And when I got there, and I looked down in that casket, do you want to know who I saw? Because our experience was almost identical. He had the same respiratory background things. The difference was he had not come through the same journey I did. And no loss for him because he was a believer. See, we've got to keep this in the right context, people. Faith and salvation is first. That's eternal life. This is just a t- taking care of our temporary clay jar, right? Still important, but not near that important. And so he's in a better place. But he left a lot of heartbreak behind. He left a weeping wife behind. And I saw me, and I thought about my 12 children. I thought, what would it be like to leave them now? What would it be like to leave my wife now? And I don't profess, brothers and sisters, to know all of God's times, times and seasons. I believe that there's promises about honoring your father and your mother. I believe there's such a thing as an untimely death. The scriptures call it that. And I don't profess to have it all figured out. I have some basic principles that is not part of this message. But I am thankful for the fact that Jesus took our sicknesses and our infirmities And it is my belief that what he bore, we need not bear. Do you agree with me? What he bore, we need not bear. Now, you will say, say, what about all these situations? Just a minute. We'll get to that soon. I would like to start first with a suggestion to your mindset about the gospel and about the kingdom of God that there is no guarantee that God's will is going to be done in this world. Otherwise, Jesus would have been teaching us to pray something false. He taught us in the Lord's Prayer to pray, Your kingdom come, your will be done, as in heaven, where it's done instantly and completely, so on the earth. Because it might not be, that's why we need to pray. And I think it applies to this area of healing. I think there's a lot of things going on, and I think because of the complexity of it is why it kind of stimmies us sometimes. But there's a lot of things going on that thwart God's will. There's spiritual things. There's sowing and reaping things. There's chemical things. The list goes on and on. Genetic things. We live in a fallen world. No matter how you cut it, this place is a good place to get out of one day, okay? But while we're here, we want to walk in in, in His will and His overcoming grace. We agree with that. And I am suggesting tonight, this is an element of overcoming grace that He would like us to exercise our spiritual muscles a little bit in, even if we don't always get it right. Are you tracking with me? That's my heart. Just like I said on the evening about spiritual authority, I want to guide you so you pray productively. That's my heart tonight again. It's not so you go out of here with a uh, bat and start hitting people over the head because they're not believing. If you're going to hit anybody over the head for not believing, start right here. That's a really good place to start. Because Jesus, my, he even rewarded the faith of somebody's friends to leave them down through. He didn't say, what's the matter with you? You don't have enough faith. Never said, he called people to more faith. But he always just, in fact, I think about the, the, um, the 
man who had the son that would throw into the water and the fire. And Jesus is like, well, the if you can is if you can believe. And he's like, oh, help my unbelief. And Jesus didn't say, well, it'll take about six months at that. Or, you know, you go back and do a Bible study. And no, he said, okay, thank you for humility. I, the, even the disciples weren't getting that one, right? You agree? But Jesus said, no problem. I have the faith. We'll do this. And that's, I think, what our humble heart should be for each of us. Lord, grow me in anointing. Grow me in faith. Why? So I may bring Jesus to the worlds I live in. That's why. So let's talk about some hindrances that would keep God's will from being done. If, if, if there were some things that would actually keep heaven's will from coming to earth, would it be good for us to know at least a couple of them? I think it would, especially if we could do something about it. And he says we can. So the first one that I've seen in my life, and it's in the scriptures, is unbelief or, wow, he's changing this. Can you give me the blue mic? No. Any of them on? Do I have it right? Thank you. Uh, wrong belief systems, because if we believe it's not for us or it's not God's will, it will affect how we pray, won't it? All right? So that's one. It's not for today. You know, I have a little news flash that is going to shock some of you. You might say, where do you walk, Merle? Like, I can't believe you're saying that. But I have yet to meet somebody that doesn't believe it's God's will for healing. I have yet to meet one person like that. You're like, what? And I'll tell you how I know. Because of what they do. James says the way you're going to know somebody's faith is by what they do. And they spend all their money, all their life resources fighting sickness. So they can't believe it's God's will or else they're an abject rebellion, right? But the thing I can't figure out is when they lose the battle, they turn around and say it was God's will. And never repent. What? See, there's something wrong. Thank you, brother. There's something wrong with our thinking. You see, it's not quite reaching together. We spend all our resources fighting something that we think is bad. Then we lose the battle, which that's the way it is in life. We don't always win everything, and especially in this earth. Okay? We always win our faith in Jesus, our salvation. But there's things we don't always win at. Would you agree? Brother John, do you, have you lost a few battles in your life? Yes, he says he's lost some battles. And so we put our entire life savings, some people do, into fighting this, and then do this, this amazing mind game when they lose and say, well, it's God's will. Who told you that? Where did you get that information? And if it's true, the information you got, then please get on your knees and repent of spending $100,000 or however much it was of God's people's money to fight against God. But see, we don't actually believe that. It's just a way, we don't know what to do with it, so we kind of throw it in there and put it on God, and that way we're free, right? How about if we said something like this? Wouldn't this be more humble? Well, we lost the battle with that one. What's wrong with that? Well, God chose not to heal or did not come through. At that, for, I don't understand it, but he didn't come through. What's wrong with that? Is that okay? Can we do that? I don't think that needs to be a bad reflection against God. It just says there's some things I don't understand. I told this widow lady up in this other state when I, I, said, I said to her, I said it to her personally and over the pulpit, I said, it's okay. Give yourself space to not figure this out right now. Give yourself space. Just say, I can't figure it out. That's okay. You don't have to. God loves you right like it is. And I don't remember what else I said, but I know the message came back through a relative. She came back and said, thank you so much. I so needed that. I felt like I had to come to a certain, you know, judgment about what happened. I said, no, just walk with God. Just let it go. You lost the battle. Your heart's broken. And you don't understand why. And that's okay. You see how we don't have to, we can, there is a middle road where we can walk with Jesus, we can pursue his health, but we don't have to be in a judgment in a, in a, a, a judgment sort of mind. We can be in grace. 
Okay. So, wrong belief keeps us from seeking God's will. The next one is right on its heels, but it's different, is complacency and laziness. We all struggle with this one. If there's anybody here that never struggles with that, you haven't yet been tired enough in the middle of the night, my opinion. Maybe there's somebody, I'm sure there's people better than I here. But, you know, I just don't want to deal with this one right now. I told you how I did well with that call in the middle of the night the other night, right? And that miscarriage and got stopped. And I almost did. And first of all, I lingered getting, I sat on the edge of my bed counting the cost. And I knew if I'm going to fight the battle, I need to get out of bed. <laughs> and so I went out to the, you know, the living area. There's times I didn't. There's times I'm like, I'm just too tired. Jesus, you take care of this one. I'm out. I'm not saying that's always wrong. But what is our passion for God's glory? What is our love for others? You know, and, and complacency, because some of these battles aren't a one-time prayer in Jesus' name, amen, prayer. Sometimes you've got to stay on it for days or weeks or months, or you've got to stay there with the person. So we, had a, we had a sister in our church. Um, uh, she was an, an older sister, a single sister, and she was going down the slope, uh, you know, where she was losing the battle and her ability to take oxygen in through her lungs was going down. They turned it all the way up to the highest level of oxygen they could give her and, and her blood, uh, blood uh, uh, oxygen level was going down. That's a bad place to be when you have COVID. That's a really bad place to be, especially if you're older, right? And... I'm going to give credit to others. I don't know if I, w I was probably too complacent. I don't know. I know I joined in, but I think others took the lead if I remember right. And they said, you know what? We are not, I'm going to call her Marianne. That was not her name. We are not going to let Marianne go. We do not think it is God's time for her to go. And she was starting to get discouraged. And you know what happens when you don't have uh, oxygen and you get discouraged yet? You're not, it's not long to the finish line anymore. And she was actually getting to the place, you know what, I, I don't even know if it's worth fighting, I'm just going to give up. But some people of God, some sisters, they got this prayer chain going and they got on the phone. They couldn't even, they weren't even allowed to go in and meet with her. But they prayed through the phone and they fought and they pressed through. And we watched as she went right up like this. I remember the first Sunday she came back to church. I said, thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys saved my life. Does how we pray and how we walk matter? Yeah. Do the decisions we make make a difference? Yes, they do. I can't tell you how that would have finished had God's people not prayed and given it all, but I have a pretty strong guess. And she would be in heaven, and that would be fine too. Uh, you, you get the point. We tend to be complacent. Sometimes we don't have the resources we need. Maybe we're alone. Maybe we don't have the church family uh, so, some of you might be there. You don't have what you need. We don't need to be condemned. These are real things. Sometimes we don't understand the big picture or the causes. This can be complex. I shared that earlier. Sometimes we don't understand God's timing. Have any of you ever had that struggle in life? God's will is this, but earth isn't lining up. But God's will is this, but earth isn't lining up. And sometimes he needs to say, wait, wait. I have something I want to do in you first before I before I snap my fingers and make that happen. And so it may be his will, but we have to understand his timing. Now, I would like to tackle one that is a hard one. It's certainly not wrong to pray if it be your will. That it's certainly right to pray. But I am concerned sometimes that this is a form of sanctified unbelief. And I don't mean it's sanctified either. We do not say this about salvation. We do not say this about victory over sin. We don't say, oh Jesus, I'm struggling with anger. If it be your will, save me from my anger. But in the meanwhile, just go on being angry till you save me. We press in. We say, I, I need help. It's, I know it's God's will for me not to lash out at my wife and children. It's written in his word. And many such things. So when we know the will of God... We pray according to the will of God. We might not know the details. We might not know the timing. That's fine.
But we say, Jesus, since you are Jehovah Rapha, since it is your character, then I'm going to appeal to who you are. Since you took our sicknesses and infirmities, I'm going to appeal to that. And certainly, if you want to tack on there according to your will, no problem. But you get my point. My point is that we don't just throw something back over to God that he asked us to do. My point is that we press in, that we fight the good fight. Okay, in closing here, I have a couple other questions that sometimes come up. Sometimes when I'm sharing this subject, people say, what about Paul's thorn in the flesh? I have a very simple answer. A, the Bible doesn't tell us what it was. And using an argument from silence to counter God's clearly expressed and revealed well is really bad Bible study practice. So just don't do that. Even if it was as I say, as some scholars think it was, we see by his example that the normal thing to do would be to press in and ask for it to be healed or fix whatever it was. And then there was a, for a certain reason, a specific revelation to Paul, time out, I got this covered, I'm doing something different here, and then we okay. That is a poor argument not to seek God for healing. I want to close with a few thoughts. What do we do when healing doesn't come through? Have any of you ever had that? What do we do? I, I've been through some very hard times where people had visions of somebody getting healed. Multiple people, unrelated, had dreams and visions of the person getting healed. By the way, I, I uh, don't want to shock you, but this is actually routine. Routinely happens with people that have terminal illnesses like cancer. This is routine in God's people. What? I mean, what is going on? Should that trouble us a little, maybe? It troubled me. But you know what? As I have processed this through with the Lord, I believe that I have an answer that I hope will be helpful to some of you. I believe these visions are actually to guide our prayers, brothers and sisters. It's telling us. And so what people do when they get these visions, they relax. Like, oh, God got this. Check out. When they should be saying, here God is showing us his will, which lines up with his word. Now let's all engage in the, in the battle on earth to, so that his kingdom come and his will be done. Oh, wait, that is what the Bible says we should do. Okay. Um, when it doesn't work out, there's things we don't understand sometimes. There's things behind the scenes, so many things. The right thing is to humbly say, well, we lost that battle. We don't understand. Jesus, would you show me, when you have some time, when I'm in a good place, would you reveal what went on? I've done that. I've done that with a young man that it, this, it really pained my heart to see him go. I was there in the final days before he left, keeping a bedside vigil, and God gave me a very rare gift in that moment. It was like he reached down and he pulled the curtain back that separates here from there. And I just got this aurora, this whiff of the world behind. And in that moment, I said, Jesus, why would we ever tell him to stay here? We're the losers, not him. And then the Lord spoke to my heart, yes, thank you. Yes, that's true, but for my glory, you can keep pressing in. Okay, that's all I needed for Jesus' glory. If I pray this guy through, he's going to get the bad end of the deal, but I'm just going to keep praying anyhow because it's for Jesus. <laughs> okay. Let's just humbly walk with God and realize there's things that we can't always sort out right away. Remember, we see in this time through a glass darkly. One day, one day this veil of tears will be behind, be, be behind and we'll see face to face. Then we'll know as we're known. Then we'll understand more perfectly. And I think it's okay to be humble, but also to seek truth. I want to say one other thing. Sometimes people misunderstand this subject and think, it was in the subjects tonight, that um, they shouldn't take medicine. Hey, I prefer the supernatural. Honestly, I do. No medicine, thumbs up, Jesus gets all the glory. But God did create the laws of this natural universe. 
and it is not a sin to use them. Now, it's, we must do it according to faith. Both my wife and I are former EMTs. My son just graduated paramedic school. That should give you a little idea what I think about those things. When my beeper goes off and there's a fire or a cardiac arrest, the Lord has taught me to pray on the way there, but I don't just drop to my knees and pray while the person's house is burning because right out there in town is a truck with water in it that I have the privilege and training to run and get it there and put it on the fire. And I'll pray there the whole way. There. And there's a cardiac arrest. I, we have the tools to do CPR. And besides that, I can get there and I can pray with people. What's wrong with that? See, they're not enemies. The laws of this natural universe don't need to be enemies to the supernatural. However, as you know, the supernatural is better. It rules over the natural. Peace, be still. And that, It's going to take a lot of medicine to calm a storm or... I don't know what you're going to do to calm a storm. <laughs> Peace, be still. Sometimes, in certain instances, I know because God led my wife and I, God will lead you in to a medical establishment. Did you know he can do that? Lord even gave my wife a dream and a vision how to walk it before we went in. He said, I'm sending you in here. I'm sending you in for this purpose. Here's your tools. And don't tell her, but she was actually like a little pastor. She had a little church in the lobby there, you know, a lady pastor. No, she wasn't a lady pastor, but she was mentoring the people. There were families there that were distraught. She was praying for them. She was, she was out of, she was in a different league. Like, what's the matter with you? You aren't even caring. You're praying for everybody else. See, God told us why we're there. And so then we went there and we were faithful. And he brought us through the other side. By the way, that can be a tough one if you're a religious zealot. Because you want Jesus always to do it supernatural and never have to give those evil medical people any credit. What if God wanted you to pray for them while you're there? Anyway, you take that out with Jesus. In closing, what I've shared here tonight has been predominantly how God has taught me by his spirit through his word. I did not have outside influences as I came to understand and walk in this. I walked, I didn't have a lot of influence about healing messages. I found them later. One day I'm driving down the road and somebody put a CD of somebody who really had faith and taught on healing in the CD player. And I listened. I never heard this before in my life. I'm like, this guy is saying exactly what I believe. How did he figure that out? He's, he did it better than I could. I was just like, I just, I went, I literally, I went and ordered a whole bunch of those CDs, and then I thought, wait, culturally, how's this going to work? And so I had to figure out a little bit out how it worked. But anyway, um, I just walked in with Jesus for me. Years later, I found other men of God who had gifts and ways of articulating certain points more clearly in certain areas, but they did not establish my understanding, merely confirmed or helped me teach or express it better. I would like to close it tonight by reading some very simple verses from James 5. If you still have your Bibles open, or if you don't, you can turn there. James chapter 5. Most of us are very familiar with these verses. And we're going to start reading at verse 14, and we're going to read through verse 17. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the assembly, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith might heal him who is sick. And the Lord might raise him up. Oh, you just keep disagreeing with me. Praise <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> the prayer of faith will raise the sick. The Lord will raise him up. I didn't write it. If you don't like it, don't talk to me about it. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your sins one to another. And pray one for another that you may be healed. The insistent prayer of a righteous person is powerfully affected. And then it says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. It did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. We are going to believe and practice that tonight. By Jesus' grace, I have been called and ordained as an overseer or elder in the church of Jesus Christ. So we're going to make it real easy tonight for you to call for the elders to do this. Can you see where I'm going? When we're done here tonight, we're going to have anybody on the front row that does not 
have something specific they want to pray for or be anointed with oil for, vacate the front row. And if you want to be prayed for, for healing of something, just like this says, you come front here and sit here and we will do just what the scriptures say. So I have asked a few other elders from some of the other assemblies to join me. And the rest of you are welcome to stay, to gather around and join in in prayer. You're also welcome to leave as you wish. We are going to continue praying for each person, if it's one, just one, or however many there are, until we're finished. So tonight, uh, we're going to do the, the invitation backwards. I'm going to have Aaron come forward to have a dismissal prayer, and then we'll have a closing song during which you can come forward to the chairs on the front row, and if you desire prayer and anointing for healing. And if you're on the front row and don't have a need for healing, you can foul out and make space for others. <laughs>